Now for something completely different. I can say that in an English accent. <laughs> this is going to seem completely frivolous compared to all the serious science that you're hearing about. But uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about some ideas as well as some of the things that uh, we've been doing at Merck. But mostly ideas and trying to change the way we think about how we do science, how we actually change the way people work. Um, just a show of hands. Anyone ever see the movie The Last Starfighter, 1984? So great. We've got some great, great viewers then. Uh, in that movie, there was uh, essentially a video game, uh, a kiosk that was dropped to planet Earth by some alien race. They were desperate. You know, they needed the, the next crop of starfighters, and they went all around the, all around the universe dropping these video game machines. And you had these young kids that were playing the video games. And once they hit the bazillion score or whatever it is, they'd actually reached that training level that they could actually be a fighter. And then the alien ship came, zapped them up, you know, <laughs> you know flash of light. And they're then the star fighters. So thinking like that, see, as I said, it's going to be completely frivolous, uh, <laughs> what, what I'm talking about. So, so there's a thesis there. There's two books I'm reading at the moment. The first one, Reality Broke is Broken by Jane McGonagall and uh, Changing the Game by David Edry and Ethan Mollick. They're looking at, you know, why, well, first of all, Jane McGonagall in her book, she's looking at why are people spending so much time in games? You know, they are either kids, come home from school, and then eight, ten hours, they open up their computer, their PS3, their Wii, their PSP, their... DS, DSi, 3DS, whatever it is. And they're there and they just get sucked into this world. They're zapping away, uh, yelling at their pa parents when they don't come down to dinner. And uh, in fact, my wife got matching t-shirts for my son and I, which just says, just one more level. So, <laughs> so, 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 so we wear those at home just to piss off my wife every now and then. Whereas the other book uh, from David Edry and uh, Ethan Mollick, they're sort of looking at, you know, what's actually... They've got a, re a lot of really good examples in there. In fact, there's a great example from Microsoft where they took some concepts around, um, you know, the beta testing for Windows Vista. It, it, you know, the slog of beta testing software, it's just really, you know, pulling teeth to actually get people to put in the information and so on. But what they did is they tracked and had scoreboards and leaderboards, and that changed the behavior of people actually participating and doing this drudge work to actually get stuff done. And people and teams were competing against each other. And there's many, many other examples like that in these books. And some of these things we've actually tried at, work, at uh, Merck. So I'm going to throw some stats up. Uh, there's going to be some stats. This was taken from Jane's book. Uh, I think there was a recent video game and software um, association survey. 69% of all heads of household plays video games. Even my wife does. 97% um, of youth play video games, and that youth is going to become the workforce. 40% of all gamers are women or girls, and uh, I, my daughter's friends come over, and they're doing head-to-head -head on their DS, so it, it is happening. One out of four gamers is over 50. I can tell you, my mum kicks my butt at Scrabble, Zuma, and Bejeweled on Facebook. It's like, I, I, I just can't outmatch her. She's just there. If you look at some of the recent game systems, like the Wii, I think the Wii radically changed uh, the elderly care scene and how they can now go bowling again. And they can now do very low-impact exercise and engage and interact. So, there is something within the game world that actually changes the way people interact with each other and actually do things which actually get them motivated. The average gamer is about 35 years old and he's been playing for 12 years. That's a lot of time and a lot of energy that if we can tap into, we can do some things different. And people aren't going to stop. Yep. Uh, again, this is a quote from the book. Game developers know better than anyone how to inspire extreme effort, reward hard work, and they know how to facilitate co cooperation, collaboration, and unimaginable scales. I'll show some more numbers in a minute. You can have teams of tens or hundreds which are working on a task for you know, days, weeks, or months, whether they're taking siege on a castle in World of Warcraft or trying to complete some complex puzzle whether they're all working on some computational problem where they're collaborating but in a gaming environment. 
These are things which are happening, and the game designers have figured out how to actually reward people to do that. Excuse me. This is exactly what we need, whether it's pharma, whether it's research. Uh, some of the big problems we have, you know, now at the Broad with big data, big data management. How are we going to get people to annotate, curate, clean up, et cetera? You know, that's just a simple example. It's not easy, it's not fun, but how do we tap into some different sense of energy where people will want to do those things? Uh, hopefully, this is a bit of an eye chart. Again, just some numbers from um, uh, some website that I pulled up. There's over 12 million registered users of World of Warcraft. You know, any given time, there's tens of thousands of people online battling, whether you're a goblin or an elf with a big sword or a little stick or a wand. You know, people are there. They're doing things together. They're communicating. There are whole industries that have uh, sprung up, the gold farming industries, which are actually taking, taking people's accounts and doing work for them so that they're getting the credits, the medals, the awards, the level ups so that they can then have a new set of functionality so that they can keep doing some other work once they log back on again. This is just taking two game series, uh, the Battlefield series and the Call of Duty series. If you just look at these games, uh, again from recent stats, you've got the source at the bottom. There's over 46 million copies of these sold. If you uh, do the math on the Black Ops one at the bottom, it was released last year and uh, by the end of the year, it already reached a billion dollars. Over 20 million copies already sold there. Putting that in perspective, if you look at the population of England, that's 62 million people. This, this is a whole country. You know, this is just a mass of a workforce, and they're getting something out of living in this escaped world, doing a lot of tasks and just doing work, and that's, that's what we need. Ribbons, medals, ranks, oh my. What, what are all these different motivators? What are these different levers which the game designers have learned to put in front of people? There's proficiency badges. You do something for a certain amount of time. You're level one, level two, level three. You're a private, you're a sergeant, you're a master sergeant. People, people communicate with each other and it's like, well, I'm a level five something something goblin and I've got this magic spell. People use these as status symbols within their own little worlds, their guilds, their clans, whatever. And, you know, typically we look at the citation index, and that's sort of our measure of success. How many papers have we published and how many people cited us? But if you look, so here I've just pulled up some reward motivation curves. On the left-hand side, this is if you plot just a reward motivation curve. When do you level up? Just looking at XP and levels you see this continuous reward uh, motivation curve in these video game worlds. Uh, it, it's very similar. I took a different, couple of different games, and it's a very, very similar curve. It's very, very easy at first. You hook them in, you give them the candy, and it gets harder and harder and harder. Whereas on the right-hand side, I just plotted a typical... This isn't my career, by the way. <laughs> 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 Hopefully not. So... A typical 20-year career where if you're lucky, you know, every four to five years you level up and you get to the next level, you get a new set of decision rights, a new set of problems and so on. And you have your annual review and this is how we reward people. And if you're lucky, if you're in a, a culture of a company where someone says, you did a great job, here's $100 or here's a, here's a little medal, um, a certificate of appreciation or whatever, you know, some, some groups are better at appreciating people and constantly rewarding, constantly reinforcing. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> some are better. So, what would you prefer? You know, continuous reward, recognition, improvement, or would you want something on the right? That's what we do. We do the stuff on the right. But the people in the video game worlds, they know how to design things to constantly entice people. And whether you're on the Facebooks and you're playing the Zynga games or whether you've got your iPads or iPods and you're buying additional credits or energies or whatever to keep, keep using and keep playing some game, people know even how to take money out of us to entice us to keep doing, keep getting to the next level. For those Girl Scouts or Cub Scouts out there, merit badges, you know, we, we like to wear, you know, what have we done and what have we achieved? People are thinking, you know, there's a whole bunch of IT guys out there. There's nerd merit, 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 sorry, I can't talk. Nerd merit badges and nerd sashes. 
There's the I can keep a zero inbox. I, can fi I fix all my, uh, my family's uh, computers, which everyone tends to do. Similarly, there's a really good site here. This is the Science Scouts website. It's mostly conceptual. They've started making some badges on Etsy where uh, you can actually buy some. I, I love the one in the top right. I make weaponized lasers badge with a picture of the Death Star. That, that's so cool. <laughs> It's like, and then, you know, I'm not Stephen Wolfram, but I have an equation or constant named after me, so that, that would be a good one. So I, I'm striving for the I, do, I Dodge Monkey Poop badge, which is somewhere down on the list if you can really find it. But it's like, well, or maybe at the Broad now, I've got a computer equipment which is bigger than my house. So, so how do you recognize people? How do they measure how well they're doing? Some of these things are things we need to think about and incorporating to add to those levers to get that extra 10, 20, 50% out of people. Because even when you're at work, you're not 100% engaged. No one is. Fold it. Most of you have probably heard of Fold it from Wash Shoe. Uh, it's very, very interesting. Now there's teams, there's competitions. There's 13-year-olds in India that can do now better structural biology work and modeling than 30-year-old, 30-year uh, experienced academics. Kids are getting on, people are getting in, and in those environments, you have that constant reinforcement that here's your score, you are doing X, Y, Z better than these other people, and there's that peer competition, there's the team competition, which is driving you know, some of the innovative and different thinking. Merck tried two things. Uh, we, we worked with Spigot. Um, Spigot works on product prediction markets. Uh, what we did with a bunch of senior oncologists at Merck is we gave them some chips. You know, so put the chips and bet on the horses. We looked, coming out of various committees, we had, you know, in the middle there, we had, this is where we think these drugs lie in terms of their probability of success. However, where you saw where the chips fell, where they spread those chips across, and where you actually looked what happened to those drugs in the end, it actually looked like where they placed the chips. So again, using the gaming analogy and a bit more freedom, it changed what we actually saw in the end. Similarly here, this is the last example I'm gonna talk about. We, we use something that we're calling, which I think someone else coined the term, persuasive technology. How do you recognize you know, things that are people, people are doing the right way? Um, we looked at two things, eLab Notebook compliance, very simple. I've got over 4,000 people on the same platform. You've got to sign, you've got to countersign, and people don't always do that. And when you've got tens of thousands of things not signed or countersigned, you have to do something about it. Someone countersigning at the right time, you give them a certain number of points. Getting it signed at the right time, another amount of points. People can accumulate these points, and then what they were able to do is cash those points in. Now, the challenge is always you don't want to pay someone a second paycheck for doing their job, so it was an altruistic payout where they could take those points and convert them into a five, ten, a hundred dollar donation to a charity of choice. And that's something that we try to tap into. That's just one of the things that Merck tends to do. So, a few what ifs. What if you could measure and reward people for bor borrowing lab reagents versus buying additional ones? And you're now giving them that cash so that they can do something within a game environment. But you can at least measure it. Or just, just measuring it. What if you rewarded people for effective data curation, management, stewardship? Proficiency-based scientific software. You look at all of the video games. You don't see a three-inch manual and a weak training course. You put, the, you put the kids in front of the software and the functionality opens up as they progress through that and their proficiency level increases. What if you could measure and reward people for collaborating and so on? Reporting safety near misses. You know, there's a puddle, someone nearly slipped. You know, we've all got to report those to OSHA and no one really reports the level they should. We need to improve safety. So a few parting thoughts, but in the essence of time, I need to move on. And... Classic Skinner box. You keep people pushing that lever. You want them eliciting the behavior. So there's many different things that we need to measure, we need to track, we can, and it's putting the right motivations in front of people. And that's some of the things that we, we started to try with Merck, and uh, we're, we're going to see how that works. Martin, thanks very much.